This is the second in a series of recordings on mixture designs. And in the first um, video, we talked about the basic mixture concepts and definitions. And you should watch that video before watching this particular video. And also, you should have read the mixture design notes part one. Okay. So in talking about mixtures, the question is, well, how do we develop a model? Well, you've seen what we call factorial models for uh, factorial designs. But for mixtures, there are particular types of models. And the most common type that are used are referred to as Chaffee polynomial mixture models. And they're named after Henri Chaffee, who was a statistician at Princeton who, in conjunction with the pharmaceutical industry, really pioneered mixture designs. So as you see, the Chaffee polynomials are relatively straightforward, and they are the default in jump. There is something called the Cox model, which I will not discuss. Uh, some people prefer it, but it's an algebraic equivalent of the Chaffee model, so I don't see the point in discussing it. Something to keep in mind, and this is really, really important. Since the settings of the factors in a mixture design are proportions of a total mixture or recipe, there cannot be an intercept. An intercept would be the value of the response if all of the main effects in the design were set to 0. Well, if you set all of the main effects to zero, you wouldn't have a mixture. The response would be undefined. Therefore, remember, you cannot have a mixture uh, model with an intercept. It has to be zeroed out. Jump takes care of this as long as it knows it's a mixture. Good statistical software, if you identify a mixture, should take care of the problem for you. And something else that this is important, if you create a mixture design in jump, you you define a factor as a mixture factor. When you save the design in the <coughs> column info window for each mixture factor, it's important to understand there are two properties that must be defined, the mixture property and the design rule. So if you created the mixture design outside of jump, you do have to manually go into the column info window for each of the mixture factors and set these two properties. Okay. So at this point, I'm going to go ahead and work through the analysis of a mixture design. And we're going to use an example called etch rate. This is a semiconductor <coughs> industry designed experiment where they are looking at a wet etch process for silicon wafers. And they're looking at three acids, nitric, hydrochloric, and phosphoric. Okay. And they've used what we call an augmented simplex centroid. It sounds more complicated than it really is. And it has 14 design runs. Okay. So there is the design, and I just show why it's called uh, an augmented simplex centroid. Very simply, when we say centroid designs, typically it means a point at each vertice, a point at the, um, well, it would be at the midpoint of each edge or face in higher dimensions and a center point. And we call this a simplex centroid. Sometimes to estimate the response surface in the interior of the design, we will add additional points. In this case, three additional points are added, so we simply call this the augmented simplex centroid. But uh, as you'll see later, most of the time these days in creating mixture designs, they're done in things like custom design and jump. And we actually usually end up with non-standard designs. So I'm going to, at this point, switch over to jump. 
And this is the acid etch experiment. Notice each of the pure component runs is replicated. Okay. There are binary points. The binary points are not replicated. And then we have the augmented points. The centroid, I'm sorry, the centroid is replicated. And then we have the augmented points. So this is capable of estimating um, nonlinear blending, three-way nonlinear blending, and binary nonlinear blending, and the individual effects. And again, if you'd like to see what the design looks like, this is a ternary plot. This is an option in the graph menu. And you saw the picture in the notes. But we have a point at each vertice. We have a point uh, midway um, on each edge of the simplex. Again, in higher dimensions, we'd have a point at the center of each um, face. An overall center, that's the centroid. And then we added the three augmented points. So I'm going to go to fit model. Oh, by the way, just to show you before I do that. Notice in the column info window, the mixture property and the design role are defined. That's important. Jump needs that information to do a correct analysis. So I'm going to go to Analyze Fit Model. I'm going to highlight the three factors, the three acids. Then under Macros, Mixture Response Surface. Jump by default does not add three-way nonlinear blending terms, but they are rather common. So if at all possible to estimate them, I do add them. So I'm highlighting the three acids in the Select Columns window and crossing. And of course, etch rate is the response. So here is our overall analysis. Remember, this is important, the three or what, however many mixture component terms must be in the model. You cannot remove one of the pure component terms. It wouldn't even make sense because, once again, this is a mixture and you need all three components present. So the individual effects, and notice, the three-way interaction terms look like it's uh, maybe possibly very strong. Therefore, I am not going to try to remove any terms from the model. Okay. So notice um, you, will, you do get the ANOVA table, the lack of fit report, no obvious lack of fit of my model, and then the estimated mixture design. Please notice that the estimates of the effect for each individual acid is really the average response that was observed in the experiment. Again, you cannot remove these terms. And then finally, we have the rest of the terms. Uh, notice the coefficient for the three-way nonlinear blending term appears quite large. I'll explain that later on. And then finally, we have the prediction profiler. And the profiler understands mixtures and understands mixture constraints as long as you have the correct properties identified in the column info window for each factor. So I'm going to get the desirability functions. And as you've seen in the past, our goal um, is to optimize the acid combinations to potentially, um, in this case, let's say we want to maximize the etch rate. In actual practice, you'd more likely want to hit some target etch rate. But for now, let's assume faster is better. And keep in mind that there appears to be significant three-way nonlinear blending. So how these uh, three acids etch is very much dependent on how they're blended together. 
So once again, as we've done before, we maximize desirability and we get an etch rate. So about 41% A, I think is hydrochloric, I've forgotten the acids, about 34% B and about 25% C, which is phosphoric. I actually think it's nitric, hydrochloric, and phosphoric. So it looks like it wants less phosphoric and more nitric and hydrochloric. And the estimated etch rate is 832 angstroms per minute. Okay. Recall that the individual etch rates were much smaller. This is very strong synergistic nonlinear blending. Also, there's another profiler if you have mixture factors. And under the profilers in the main um, report window, mixture profiler. Okay. And furthermore, I have two profilers or visualizations open. I'm going to click on the prediction profiler menu, go down to factor settings, and link profilers. So now they will actually work in combination with each other. Okay. So just again, what I'm going to do, notice I'm changing the settings in the profiler of the acids, but by the way, notice that jump always honors the sum to one constraint. It's been because again I've identified mixture factors and I'm going to once again go back, maximize desirability, then let's take a look at the mixture profiler. Okay, so the mixture profiler is showing that our optimum is somewhere in this region. Okay. And I can add a contour grid to help you see uh, where the optimum is. So in this range is the maximum possible etch rate. Notice as we head towards uh, phosphoric acid C, the etch rates drop off rather rapidly. So it appears for whatever reason phosphoric acid really slows down the etching reactions. Uh, likewise, I'll just quickly show you. I could say I want to hit a target. Again, this is usually what the engineers would do. And let's say I want to hit a target. I'll make something up. 625 plus or minus 50. So again, once I have my mixture model, maximize desirability and it's found a solution. Again, I'm trying to match a target, so there are infinite possibilities. This is the first one that Jump encounters, and again, uh, the profiler does a nice job of showing you where it is in the mixture space. Okay. So that's basically the fundamentals of analyzing a mixture design. And again, this is shown uh, throughout the notes. Just a bit more about uh, mixture models. Again, we tend to use the Chaffe polynomials and basically this is their form. Remember, no intercept allowed. So we have the pure component terms, binary nonlinear blending, and three-way nonlinear blending is the possibility. Okay. And again, uh, having those in the design, uh, it, can, it is very versatile. It won't always fit. I'm going to actually click through to uh, slide 28. Remember the three-way nonlinear blending coefficient was over 9200. That seemed very large considering the etch rates were in the range of 100 and something to 800 and something. But notice how you interpret the coefficient. So at the centroid, that indicates an increase of 342 angstroms. An increase in what? Well, that's the increase over what the average would have been if there were purely linear blending. So the nonlinear blending coefficients show you, 
and I actually think this is a nice feature of Chaffee models, shows you the relative shift up or down in the response due to nonlinear blending. So three-way nonlinear blending at the centroid increases the etch rate 342 angstroms above the uh, overall average of the endpoints or vertices which would have been 390. Okay. So that's how you interpret uh, these nonlinear blending coefficients. Okay. Uh, just an example of some models. Uh, there is something called the full cubic model. It's uh, these delta terms fit what we call nonlinear um, cubic blending. And I'll just show you a simple example. Here's what that means. The nonlinear blending has this nature. It's not common, but sometimes it can occur. And if you have a design that will fit a few full cubic model, you may detect this behavior. Most of the time, the nonlinear blending is quadratic, either up, concave up or concave down. And as a result, a very popular mixture model, we just used it for the uh, acid etch example, is called the special cubic. It has the pure component terms, the binary nonlinear blending terms, and then it adds a three-way nonlinear blending term. Okay. Relatively simple model, and it works in many, many scenarios. And finally, a complicated model is called the quartic model. These are for highly nonlinear surfaces. Uh, I really don't know that I've ever seen the need for one and they're extremely difficult to estimate. It may not look like it, but these squared terms in actual practice are very hard to estimate. Uh, we, there's a great deal of correlation that builds up among the coefficients, and these models tend to be very uh, unstable. Okay, so that covers the basics of mixture models and how to do an analysis of a mixture design.